top 10 hypothetical planets that might exist in our solar system. Number 10. A shy planet. Is there a planet hiding in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter? Over the last two centuries, many astronomers have thought so. In 1801, Giuseppe Piazzi, an Italian priest, noticed a fairly bright object in that region. He named it Ceres after the Roman goddess of farming. The following year, German astronomer Heinrich Olbers discovered another object there, which he called Pallas. And in 1806, he added Vesta to the list, which by then also included Juno, discovered in 1804 by fellow German Karl Ludwig Harding. Olbers suggested that all of them were fragments of a planet that had crashed into another celestial body or had been torn apart by its proximity to Jupiter. This remained a popular premise for many years. However, today, this thesis has been disproved. They are simply very large asteroids, held with a million smaller ones in orbit between Mars and Jupiter. Together, they might have formed a planet had it not been for Jupiter's massive gravity that keeps them apart, overcoming their own gravitational attractions. Number 9. What happened to Planet 5? The late heavy bombardment, when a huge number of asteroids smashed into Mercury, Venus, the Earth, Mars and our Moon, occurred about 3.8 billion years ago. Where these asteroids came from, no one is quite sure. The most intriguing theory is that there was a planet, simply called Planet 5, that orbited between Mars and the asteroid belt. This was proposed in 2002 by NASA scientists Jacques J. Lesseur and John Chambers. They suggest that Jupiter's gravitational pull caused Planet 5 to be unstable. It then crashed into the asteroid belt and flung thousands of them towards Mars and the inner planets. So, what happened to Planet 5? The scientists posed several possibilities. Either it careered into the Sun, or was flung out into space. And this was their most speculative idea, crashed into Mars, creating the Borealis Basin that covers 40% of Mars, and also through fragments at the inner planets. Not every scientist agrees with Lesseur and Chambers. They think that Planet 5 never existed, and that the asteroids that bombarded the solid planets were ones from the asteroid belt, disturbed by changes in the orbit of Jupiter and Saturn, or that Mars crashed into a large asteroid and the fragments were thrown towards the Sun. Number 8. Slippery Mercury The planets orbit the Sun in stretched circles known as ellipses, ovals in effect. Mercury is the nearest planet to the Sun. Sir Isaac Newton was worried. He realized through observation that Mercury's orbit was a little strange. It changed slightly with each revolution of the Sun. It just didn't fit with his brilliant equations. In 1859, Urbain Jean-Joseph Le Ferrier, a famous French astronomer, proposed that there was a planet closer to the Sun whose gravitation was causing this anomaly. He named it Vulcan and said that, unfortunately, it was impossible to spot because it was so close to the Sun. For years, this explanation was accepted, particularly as several amateur astronomers claimed to have spotted the mysterious Vulcan. Einstein, in his general theory of relativity, showed that Vulcan wasn't necessary to explain Mercury's seemingly strange behavior. He theorized that mass causes warping of space-time, like a dimple in an elastic sheet. Because of this, as Mercury orbits, its ellipsis would slowly rotate round the Sun. This is called the precession of Mercury, and fully explains why gradually it moves from its expected position. All our solar system's planets do this too. But, at such huge distances from the Sun, the effect of space-time is so incredibly tiny that their precessions are presently unobservable. Number 7. Mega-Earth The Oort cloud is an immense sphere of icy debris that surrounds the solar system and is up to 10 trillion miles away from the Sun. In 1999, astrophysicists from the University of Louisiana proposed that there was a planet in the cloud which they named Tyche. They suggested that it orbits the Sun approximately once every two million years and is over a thousand times bigger than the Earth. The scientists suggested that the long-period comets, ones that take over 200 years to orbit the Sun, come from the Oort cloud and that Tyche's gravity causes them to be flung towards it. 
no proof has been found. From 2012 to 2014, NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer telescope studied the proposed location of Tyche, but unfortunately found nothing. Number 6. Theia does exist. Where did our moon come from? It's thought that a planet, Theia, crashed into us 4.5 billion years ago, just 40,000 years or so after the Earth was first formed. When this theory was first suggested, the proposal was that it smashed a large lump into our space, which after millions of years of rounding through gravity, became what we now see as our moon. This viewpoint has been challenged, following analysis of the moon rocks collected during the Apollo missions. It appears that both the Earth and the Moon are, by and large, made of similar material. The early Earth and Theia, in effect, mixed together and that, later, a fragment of Earth Theia broke off and became our Moon. Number 5. The Earth's Distant Twin In the mysterious world of particle physics, it's thought that every particle has an antiparticle. So, for example, the antiparticle of the electron is the anti-electron, or positron. Nearly two and a half thousand years ago, a Greek philosopher called Philolaus proposed the idea that the planet Earth had a counter-Earth. He said that it couldn't be seen from here, as it was always mirrored on the opposite side of the Sun. And as we rotated round the Sun, it did the same. It's worth noting that a heliocentric model of our solar system was around long before Copernicus proposed it. Unfortunately, this is a hypothetical planet that simply couldn't have existed. The effects of gravity, particularly from Mercury and Venus, would have distorted the orbit of counter-Earth and, over time, moved it from its counter-position. Eventually, supposing that it was also about 93 million miles away from the Sun, the two planets, Earth and counter-Earth, would have met. Either they would have crashed into each other, or their gravities would have pushed them into new orbits. Number 4. The End Is Nigh Well, according to Zechariah Sitchin, a famous author who proposed theories on human origins involving ancient astronauts. Luckily, Nye is 3,600 years from now. Sitchin, in his 1976 book, The Twelfth Planet, proposed the existence of Nibiru, which he claimed orbits the Sun every 3,600 years. Just for clarification, Nibiru is often called Planet X, which is not the same as Planet 9, which is also called Planet X. We'll look at that one a bit later. Anyway, self-proclaimed psychic Nancy Leader claimed that aliens had been in touch with her, warning that the hypothetical planet would crash into the Earth in 2003. It didn't. She revised her warning and said that she received new information that this catastrophe would happen in 2012. Meanwhile, in 2011, comet Elenin approached the Earth but broke up before it could cause any harm to us. Some theorists claim that this was an indication of Nibiru's imminent arrival. Anyway, 2012 came, but luckily Nibiru didn't. So according to Sitchin, the year 5612 could be bad news for the Earth, but hopefully not. Number 3. Mysterious Shepherd What about Planet 9 that we mentioned earlier? This one could indeed exist, according to scientists from NASA and the California Institute of Technology. There are solar bodies, way beyond Neptune, that are strangely clustered and tilted in identical ways. They are known as extreme trans-Neptunian objects. This arrangement and behavior is so improbable that these astronomers believe they are being shepherded by an undiscovered solar planet that they call Planet 9. They think it must have a mass between 5 and 10 times that of the Earth, and is about the same size as Neptune or Uranus, and orbits the Sun every 10 to 20,000 years. So far, it hasn't been spotted, but it is definitely under serious consideration. Number 2. Early Earth split into two? Is the Earth actually the planet Tiamat? This is another theory proposed by the famous author and researcher Zechariah Sitchin. It all started with the Sumerians. They thought there was a planet named Tiamat between Mars and Jupiter. Tom Vlan Flandern, in his 1994 book Dark Matter, Missing Planets and New Comets, suggested that it had been destroyed 65 million years ago to become the asteroid belt. Zachariah Sitchin disagreed. In his book The Twelfth Planet and the Cosmic Code, 
He suggested that Tiamat had crashed into another hypothetical planet, Marduk. The collision had created a new planet which broke in half. One half is the Earth and the other is the Moon, and the remaining fragments became the asteroid belt. Number 1. Dr. Seuss's Planet Was there an icy, giant planet in our solar system that can explain its present arrangement? In 2005, at an international conference in Nice, France, eminent scientists and astronomers proposed that our solar system began with five giant planets – the present Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, with a hypothetical ice giant between Saturn and Uranus. The now missing ice giant's name has not been agreed upon. Suggestions include Hades, Liber, Mephitis, and playfully Thing 1 from Dr. Seuss's Cat in the Hat book for children. It's very complicated, however, put simply, the scientists suggest that this ice giant had a close encounter with Jupiter, thus bringing Jupiter and Saturn into their present orbits. It may have triggered the late heavy bombardment of the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, the Earth and Mars, and stabilized their orbits. So, where is it now? It suggested that when it had a near-miss with Jupiter, it was cast into outer space. Astronomers are searching for it, but, as yet, with no success. Top 10 Fresh Finds Proving Jupiter is a Weird Place Number 10. Lightning Strikes In English-speaking countries, we say love at first sight. In France, they say coup de foudre, which literally means a lightning strike, because it used to be so sudden and mysterious. Over the millennia, lightning was profoundly unfathomable, and was often seen as something to do with the gods. But we have to thank Benjamin Franklin in 1752 for taking the mystery out of the phenomenon. It was he who established, beyond doubt, that it was purely electrical in nature. It results from two electrically charged areas in the atmosphere equalizing themselves. Other planets are known or are suspected to have lightning, and strikes on Jupiter are the best understood. At first, Jupiter's lightning was thought to be very different from here on Earth. For some reason, the strikes in the gas giant only appeared to release low-frequency radio waves, whereas on Earth they range from low megahertz to very high gigahertz frequencies. However, in 2018, the Juno spacecraft solved that particular conundrum. Jupiter's lightning also emitted radio waves whose frequencies were low to high. It had purely been an error caused by previous craft's inadequate sensing equipment. However, there does remain one mystery. Lightning on the Earth is almost unknown at the poles, and its greatest concentration is in the equatorial regions. For some undetermined reason, it's the other way around on Jupiter. But then, Jupiter is virtually all gas, so that may have something to do with it. Number 9. Not so jolly when Gustav Holst wrote his seven-movement orchestral suite The Planets in 1916, he nicknamed Jupiter as the bringer of jollity. There's nothing particularly jolly about the actual planet with its constant, violent storms though. However, until recently, it was thought to be composing music too. In 2018, the Juno spacecraft flew by Jupiter, breaching the gas giant's magnetic field. Suddenly, on NASA's speakers, there was a huge rush of roars and screeching. Sadly, Jupiter wasn't composing its own music. It was an entry phenomenon known as bow shock, rather similar to the sonic booms here when aircraft break the sound barrier, but this time with a spacecraft. The shock lasted two hours as the craft zipped towards the planet at 150,000 miles per hour. Number 8. A Swell Place to Be Jupiter's mass is 300 times that of the Earth's, but the Goliath wasn't always so Goliathan. The formation of the solar system is more or less understood. The primordial sun was originally orbited by a huge dust-filled cloud. Some parts were more dense than others and attracted more dust to them. These eventually coalesced into the planets as we know them now. In those early millennia, Jupiter was originally about 20 times Earth's mass, a fraction of its present size. Then, it stopped swelling. Why was that? It's thought that massive protoplanets, no longer with us, smashed into Jupiter. 
The force was so great that, rather than adding much mass to the planet, they injected energy as those invaders disintegrated. This slowed Jupiter's growth. Eventually, as the bombardments reduced in intensity, Jupiter started swelling again to its present form where it contains two and a half times more mass than the entirety of all the other planets put together. Having said that, the Sun is still a thousand times more massive than its gassy offspring. 7. Juno – What Those Stripes Are No, stars and stripes, but lots of swirls and stripes. Jupiter is astoundingly beautiful, albeit at a safe distance. Until 2018, no one knew the depth of these colorful bands. Were they just on the surface, or did they plunge way down? The Juno spacecraft, which orbited the planet every 53 days, answered this question. Amongst many other things, it measured gravitation. It tracked the bands and noticed that they had a greater gravity than the surrounding non-banded areas. Scientists built up a 3D image to form a gravity map of the planet. They found that the stripes descended to a depth of nearly 2,000 miles. The gravity maps may, following further analysis, give some clues as to one absolute mystery. Why is it that, below the flows, Jupiter's fluid interior behaves like a solid? Number 6. Going the wrong way Sometimes, when you point a powerful telescope into the sky, you don't find what you're looking for, but find something else that's just as fascinating. This happened in 2017, when astronomers were searching for the theoretical Planet X, the anticipated ninth planet in our solar system. Its existence is theorized because there appears to be something tugging at our planets, causing very slight differences between observation and orbital theory. Planet X is theorized to be in the direction of Jupiter. Someone noticed something unexpected. Previously, 69 moons had been spotted orbiting the gas giant. They saw another 10. But there was something distinctly weird about eight of them. The other two spin with Jupiter. These eight, however, were going in the opposite direction, against Jupiter's rotation. This motion is known as retrograde, from the Latin retrogradus, retro meaning backwards, and gradus meaning to walk. One, called veil to do, meaning illness, really isn't going to be very well soon. It's approaching a head-on with one of Jupiter's spin moons, and both are doomed. Number 5. Magnetic Untidiness if the Earth had a magnetic field like Jupiter's, our compasses wouldn't just turn, they'd be glued to the ground. Jupiter's magnetic field is 20,000 times stronger than ours. But it's weird. Before the Juno spacecraft visited in 2016, it was thought that Jupiter's magnetic fields were not dissimilar to the Earth's. North Pole, near the northern axis, and the South Pole, near the southern one. However, Juno showed that it wasn't quite as tidy as presumed. The magnetic South Pole was indeed located near the geographical South, but the North Pole was, as it were, all over the place. There was a strange magnetic ribbon, and fields that were so chaotic that they resembled a plate of spaghetti. Some parts had northern characteristics, but with no southern counterparts. And bizarrely, there's a strong South Pole around the equator. The Earth's magnetic fields are generated by its molten iron core. On Jupiter, however, it seems that there's a swirling hydrogen ocean below the surface that does the job. Unraveling the mysterious magnetic fields of Jupiter may lead to understanding what's actually happening deep inside the planet. But at the moment, it's just educated guesswork. Number 4. A Cold Spot Jupiter's famous Great Red Spot is not alone. From an observatory in Chile, scientists have noticed another area of colorful, swirling gas. But this one is very different in behavior from its companion. Firstly, it's about 200 degrees centigrade colder than the surrounding area. And although it's thought to be a thousand years old, it keeps appearing and disappearing. At its largest, it's about 7.5 by 15,000 miles across. And at its smallest, it's simply not there. The Chilean scientists think it's associated with Jupiter's aurora. As we all know, the Earth's auroras, seen over the northern and southern polar regions, are caused by a magnetosphere interacting with the solar wind. 
With Jupiter, however, it's thought to come from two locations, from the moon Io and from charged particle currents rising from Jupiter's magnetosphere. When Jupiter's auroras are quiet, that's when the great cold spot disappears, and then when the auroras intensify, the spot comes back. This is a further indication that Jupiter's magnetosphere is highly unstable. Number 3. Not where we think it is We all know that the planets of our solar system orbit the Sun, but that's not the whole story. Planets actually orbit the solar system's center of gravity. Usually, because the Sun is so massive, we think that's the center. It isn't. Jupiter, whose mass is two and a half times the mass of all the other planets put together, also has a noticeable gravitational effect on the solar system. The solar system's center of gravity is actually somewhere between these two great masses, and both rotate round this center. Obviously, this gravitational point is very close to our Sun, as it is nearly a thousand times more massive than the gas giant. Although we can consider that, relatively speaking, all the planets orbit the Sun, the reality is that it's doing a bit of orbiting too. Number 2. Hot Stuff Jupiter, as we've seen, is huge. Its diameter is nearly 90,000 miles or 140,000 kilometers. The Sun's diameter is only 10 times greater. In fact, scientists reckon that Jupiter is as large as any planet can possibly be. Although, it would have to have 75 times more mass to fuse hydrogen and thus become a star like the Sun, it's only 30% less than a red dwarf, the most common type of star in our galaxy, the Milky Way. Jupiter actually emits more heat than it receives from the Sun. Some of that heat is caused by its constant shrinkage of about an inch each year. Contraction causes energy in the form of heat to be released. The remainder of its radiated heat comes from helium sinking to its center through the outer hydrogen layers. This releases potential energy as heat. To put it into perspective, however, the Sun actually gives off one million times as much heat as Jupiter. Number 1. Pentangles on Jupiter On Saturn, there are two cyclones. They're neatly arranged, one at each pole. As Jupiter is also a gas giant, scientists predicted that something similar would be found there. But Jupiter is a planet, bizarrer than bizarre. In 2018, the Juno spacecraft photographed Jupiter's poles. Yes, there were storms there, but so weird that, at the moment, they defy explanation. At the South Pole, there was a cluster of six cyclones. In the middle, it measured nearly 4,000 miles across. It was surrounded by the other five, each being between approximately three and a half to four and a half miles wide. Here's the weird bit. They formed a clear, geometrically accurate pentagon. At the North Pole, there were nine storms, one in the middle, as before, surrounded by the other eight. And the final weird part, although all the cyclones, north and south, touched each other, they didn't affect each other. There's no mixing, no cross-disturbance at all. Almost as if they're discrete entities. No one has the slightest idea what's going on. Jupiter is definitely weird. Top 10 Earth-like facts about Mars Number 10. Grander Canyon Water is a very peculiar substance that no one fully understands. However, it does appear to be the key to life as we know it. For many years, it was thought that Mars was little more than a cold, dust-blown desert, with temperatures as low as minus 143 degrees centigrade or minus 225 degrees Fahrenheit. From earlier telescopic studies, there were hints of water in its earlier times. Dendritic networks that indicate ancient river courses, canyons like Madim Vallis, which is much larger than the Grand Canyon, and scoured land that points to massive outflows of water, possibly from bygone glaciers. However, in 2008, NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spotted small amounts of water briefly flowing down some slopes on the Red Planet, though evaporating almost immediately. It only flows in summer when temperatures can reach 35 degrees centigrade or 95 degrees Fahrenheit. 
In much colder areas, some waters flow, probably because they contain salt, which lowers the temperature at which water freezes. Number 9. So much water. Mars, like the Earth, has ice caps at its north and south poles. And, in the central latitudes, it has belts of glaciers. These weren't spotted until recently, as they're covered by a thick layer of dust. The dust is probably keeping the ice from melting and evaporating. Indeed, if all of Mars's trapped ice were melted, it would cover the entire surface to a depth of 11 meters, or 36 feet. The reason why any loose water evaporates so readily is that the planet's atmosphere is thin. Low atmospheric pressure reduces the temperature at which water boils. This is because the water molecules need less energy to escape, and so they do. And in Mars's case, which has an atmospheric pressure less than 1% of ours, the evaporation is almost instantaneous. Number 8. The Four Seasons Mars, like the Earth, has four seasons as it rotates. The main difference is the duration of the seasons. Although a Martian day is similar to ours, it's about 24 hours 40 minutes, it takes nearly twice as long to go around the Sun, 687 Earth days. In the North, spring lasts for seven of our months. Summer, six months, autumn or fall is just over five months, and winter is slightly more than four of our months. There's a significant difference between the temperatures in the South and the North. In the Martian summer, the North's maximum temperature is minus 20 degrees centigrade or minus 4 degrees Fahrenheit, whilst in the South, it can reach about 35 degrees centigrade or 95 degrees Fahrenheit. This explains the tempestuous dust storms driven by these temperature differences. Number 7. Aurora Martis Anyone who has seen the aurora lights in the high northern or southern latitudes of our planet cannot help but be astounded by their wondrous beauty. The auroras on Earth are caused by charged particles, mostly electrons and protons, emitted by the Sun and interreacting with the Earth's magnetic field. The resulting ionization and excitation of our atmosphere emits the light that we see. Mars also has auroras. Unlike the Earth, Mars does not have a global magnetic field. It has numerous umbrella-shaped fields, mostly in the southern hemisphere, which are thought to be remnants of its now extinct global magnetism. In 2015, NASA also detected a very slight global aurora in its Mars atmosphere. Mars has an upper atmosphere of hydrogen, and it's thought that the solar wind is reacting with this. If we were on Mars, however, we wouldn't be able to see it. The light is entirely ultraviolet. Number 6. Earth Days – Mars Days As we've already seen, Mars and the Earth have similar day lengths. Day lengths vary throughout the entire solar system. For example, Jupiter's day lasts about 10 hours, whereas a day on Venus lasts nearly 117 Earth days. So why did Mars and the Earth end up with similar day lengths? Nothing mysterious, just coincidence. Planets form from dust clouds that are realized during the creation of stars. Small areas of greater density, through developing a localized gravity, attract more dust to them. And so, over eons, a huge ball of compacted dust is formed, a planet. At the beginning, these protoplanets are constantly bombarded with the remaining dust and rocks surrounding them. These interfere with any spin the globe may have. Eventually, the early planet, through gravity, clears its environs of troublesome neighbors, and whatever speed it was spinning remains more or less the same. Mars and Earth will continue with their similar day lengths, unless something substantial crashes into them. And if that happens, neither we nor any bug-eyed Martians will be around to reset our clocks. Number 5. Magnets for Life our solar system's planets fall into two categories. Moving out from the Sun, Mercury, Venus, the Earth and Mars are solid. Beyond the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, we have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, which are mostly made up of toxic gases with, at the very most, 
comparatively tiny solid or liquid cores. As far as is known, life only exists on the Earth. It's very unlikely that life could develop and evolve on the outer gas giants simply because, with the simple chemicals flowing around, often at vast speeds, there's little opportunity for them to aggregate to form the appropriate complex molecules. Mercury and Venus are probably lifeless too, both are way too hot. Mars, however, is an open question. Could Mars be terraformed? The big problem here is that it has no global magnetosphere to stop the Sun's charged particles, stripping it of any atmosphere and allowing water to exist as liquid on its surface. Scientists suggest that we need to place a magnetic generator between Mars and the Sun to deflect the solar wind. If this were done, atmospheric pressure on Mars could be increased and allow the ice in the polar regions to melt. This released water could then be split to release oxygen. At the moment, however, this is more science fiction than science fact. Number 4. Mount Everest Plus we're all aware of the variety and sometimes astonishing beauty of the Earth's natural landscape. The mountains, the valleys, the canyons, and so much more. Mars also has areas of stunning landscape. One such example is the volcanic mountain Olympus Mons, which is about three times the height of Mount Everest. It lies in the vast upland region known as Tharsis. Tharsis is also home to astonishing lava falls, like waterfalls but of molten rock. They pour from a 20-mile diameter crater in breathtaking, beautiful flows. Number 3. Proof of Life One of the great drivers for exploring Mars is the possibility that it either has life there or did so in the past. Discovery of life on another planet would be a paradigm shift in our understanding of the universe. One of the Martian rovers has found organic molecules in the rocks of Gale Crater. Here, there was a lake some 3.5 billion years ago. As life appears to have started on Earth nearly 4 billion years ago, this is a hopeful sign. All known living things contain four organic molecules – carbohydrates, lipids or fats, proteins and nucleic acids. Although these have been found in Gale Crater, it doesn't prove the existence of life there, now or in the past. Some chemical reactions that have nothing to do with life can also produce these molecules. However, something else has been found on Mars that could add to this suspicion. It's methane gas. Many living organisms release methane, cows, termites and rice being examples, plus the breakdown of organic material. Methane breaks down within a few hundred years. Something is replenishing it on Mars. Again, this is not definitive proof of living things on Mars. Methane release can occur in areas of volcanic action, and here on the Earth, also chemical changes in the mantle, the layer between the core and the crust. Number 2. Potatoes on Mars? The mastery of farming was critical to the development of human civilizations. It marked the transition from loose hunter-gatherer societies to complex ones that led to employment, specialization and the development of technology. The ability to farm on Mars is also critical. Food, natural food, needs to be generated there if any colonization can be achieved in years to come. Can it be done? NASA, in partnership with the International Potato Center in Peru, tried growing potatoes in Mars-like conditions. They grew the plants in sealed containers that replicated Mars' harsh climate. The soil from the Pampas de la Yoya Desert had been sterilized as microbes assist in plant growth and would thus interfere with the experiment. The experiment, such as it was, succeeded, but the results are inconclusive. First, it's possible that not all microbes were killed. Second, seeds failed to develop and cuttings had to be used instead. Radiation would almost certainly kill cuttings if they were transported to the Red Planet. More helpful results were achieved at Villanova University in Pennsylvania, United States. There, some students grew lettuce, hops, kale and garlic. They processed volcanic basalts to replicate Mars' soil. Unfortunately, basalts contain perchlorate, which is deadly poisonous to humans. 
It can be removed using certain bacteria, and this process could be used on Mars. Doing this would have the added bonus that the bacteria release oxygen, which would be good news for terraforming Mars' atmosphere. As Mars only receives half our sunlight, which obviously is critical for plant growth, this is also a problem, as is the dangerous ultraviolet radiation that beats down on Mars' surface. But the indications are encouraging. Number 1. The Islands of Mars Admittedly, there's no significant loose water on Mars now, but are there islands there? Ones that, like some of ours, rose from the seas. NASA is watching the island of Hunga Tonga, Hunga Heipe, very carefully. It rose out of the South Pacific Ocean off the coast of Tonga in 2009, following an underwater volcanic eruption. It was expected to submerge shortly afterwards, as other such volcanic islands have done. But no, it's still there. Scientists have worked out why. Salt water from the ocean has chemically reacted with the volcanic dust and has thus stabilized its foundation. They think that that is how some of the similar-looking landforms developed on Mars during the time when it too had oceans and seas. The top 10 changes the Earth would suffer if it had no moon. The moon plays a very significant role in our planet's behavior and indeed in our very existence. So, what would happen if the moon disappeared? Number 10. No more tides. If you live near the sea or an ocean, you're very aware of the tides. You see the water rushing towards you or watch it flowing away. As we all know, this is mainly caused by the moon's gravity. When the moon's overhead, its gravity pulls the water towards it, making a bulge which we see as a high tide. On the other side of the Earth, it also bulges, though not quite as much. So when there's a high tide in Argentina, there's one in China too. At the same time, on the sides at 90 degrees to these high tides, there are low tides. And as the moon rotates around the planet, these tides shift with it. It happens once a day. The difference in height between low and high tides can be as much as 50 feet. So what would happen if the moon disappeared? The answer is clear to see. These tidal rises and falls would dramatically reduce by at least a third. This would flatten out the oceans and seas. Water levels at the poles would increase. Coastal ecosystems would be hugely altered. Sea snails, crabs, mussels and the like need the tides for survival. And our climate would change hugely as the ocean currents would be affected. Not good. Number 9. Slow Spin Cycle The speed of the Earth's rotation is getting slower and slower. Indeed, eventually, we're going to have to change the design of our clocks because in 200 million years' time, there'll be 25 hours in a day, not 24 as now. So, no hurry, it's only by 2 milliseconds every 100 years. Though, on June the 30th, 2012, we did have to add an extra second to the world's clocks, so it is real. And when the dinosaurs ruled the Earth, a day lasted only 23 hours. Indeed, when the planet was first formed about 4.5 billion years ago, each day was merely four hours long. Does that matter? Yes, the climate would be vastly changed as the present-day warming and cooling would last longer, heating more, cooling more. Even an extra hour would make a huge difference. But at present, no need to worry. Number 8. A tilt too far. The Earth doesn't spin like a top or a gyroscope. It's slightly tilted by about 23.5 degrees. That's why we have seasons. For some of the year, the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun and the southern one is tilted away. More heat for the north, which we call summer, less heat for the south, which we call winter. And about 180 days later, it's the other way around. How did this tilt occur? There are several theories but the most credible one is that a protoplanet about the size of Mars, which we usually call Theia, crashed into our planet, creating the moon from debris and tilted the rotation of the Earth. The moon then, through its gravity, stabilized the Earth's tilt. So, what would happen if the moon disappeared? There's some argument about its effect. Some scientists reckon that the Earth would tilt by another 85 degrees, almost turning on its side. Others calculate it would just be 20 degrees more. Either way, it's bad news. 
The poles would now be exposed far more to the sun's heat and the ice caps would melt completely, and possibly new ones would form near the equator. This, in turn, would cause extreme changes to our climate. Indeed, even a tilt of one degree could trigger a global ice age, chilly and most unwelcome. Number 7. Mini Moons and Cosmic Dust In 2018, Hungarian astronomers discovered huge clouds of dust orbiting the Earth. Some of them are nearly 10 times the size of our planet. They are held there in a perfectly balanced tug-of-war, pulled in one direction by the Moon's gravity and in the other by the Earth's gravity. These places are called Lagrange points, where, in effect, there is no significant gravitational effect. If we could park the International Space Station there, we wouldn't have to make constant changes to its orbit, as we have to now, because it orbits close to the Earth and risks crashing down into it. Not only are there dust clouds, but also occasionally small asteroids, sort of mini-moons. If the Moon disappeared, these dust clouds and mini-moons would either shoot out into space or, in the worst-case scenario, be attracted by the Earth's gravity and crash into us. Goodbye life. Number 6. Cosmic Shield Every day, over 30 tons of space debris, meteors, asteroids and dust are traveling at huge speeds towards the Earth. Luckily, most burn up in our atmosphere. But without the Moon, the numbers would be vastly more, and Earth would be dangerous and intolerable. The Moon is really quite large, it's nearly a quarter the size of the Earth and exerts a significant gravitational effect and diverts most of these space debris away from us. It's fortunate that we have our own cosmic shield to protect us. Number 5. Goodbye Mountains We're familiar with the Moon's gravitational effect on our oceans and sea, but it also creates tides of the very ground upon which we stand. As the Moon rotates around us, it can raise the height of the Earth's crust by up to 12 inches each day. Many minor earthquakes are caused by this. More than that, they'd probably be no awe-inspiring mountains. The Moon was probably formed by the impact of a protoplanet, Theia, crashing into the Earth and smashing a huge amount of its crust into space. If that crust had remained on the Earth, it would have been far thicker and more stable. Sounds better, doesn't it? Well, no. Because of the relative thinness and unevenness of the crust, it moves around the planet in the form of huge plates, known as tectonic plates. Where these separate, trenches, such as the vast ones in the oceans, open up, and where they bash into each other, mountains are pushed up. Bash is probably not quite the word. They actually move quite slowly, thank goodness. For example, the North American plate moves at about an inch a year. Doesn't sound much, but as a result, there are about 150 quakes a week in California. Number 4. Problems with wind How would you feel if you constantly face winds of over 100 miles per hour? Planets spin, and their atmospheres, if they have them, spin with them. And the faster the planets spin, the faster the atmosphere moves. For example, Jupiter rotates in about 10 hours. Its winds, in other words, disturbances in its atmosphere, travel at about 100 to 200 miles per hour. Saturn, on the other hand, spins slightly faster and has winds of over 1,000 miles per hour. Without the pull of the Moon, and it's the drag effect, the Earth would rotate faster, and we could expect the entire planet to suffer hurricanes, tornadoes and winds that would make life almost unbearable. Number 3. All that glitters. We wear it on our fingers. It's in our smartphones, our computers, GPS units, and virtually all electronic equipment. It's even in our mouths as gold crowns. So many uses. But its relative abundance is down to a collision eons ago between the Earth and the protoplanet Theia. It is thought that, about 4.5 billion years ago, a Mars-sized rock called Theia hit our planet. The surfaces of each planet were cast into space to form the Moon. However, Theia's core remained, rich in valuable, heavy elements like gold, and the core would have generally sunk to the Earth's core and fused with it. Over millennia, through volcanic and seismic activity, some of these elements were lifted to near the surface where they can be mined and thus enrich our cultures and our technologies. Number 2. Life as we know it 
We humans might only exist because the Earth has a moon. Life, as we know, started in the oceans. These early bodies of water contained chemicals which over time reacted together to form nucleic acids, which are the building blocks of life. In part, the gravitational effect of the moon increased the concentration of these chemicals, bringing them closer together. Without the moon's effect, the concentrations would have been much lower, and thus reduced the chance of interaction between the chemicals. Also, the moon is largely responsible for the tides. These tides and currents have the effect of mixing the chemicals in the water, critical for promoting the necessary reactions. And finally, even if simple life had developed, it's unlikely that complex forms would have evolved. Why? Because the moon, through its gravitational effect, reduces the number of asteroids and meteors that crash and have crashed into the Earth. The constant bombardment would have made the environment too hostile for life to develop as we know it. By the way, that's why astronomers looking for potential life-bearing planets consider finding ones with substantial moons to be almost essential. Massages and Magnets The Earth is a giant magnet, and for our sakes, thank goodness it is. All the time, the Sun emits charged particles that blast into our atmosphere, and unless there was something to protect it, they would completely strip it away. This is what happened to Mars. The red planet was not dissimilar to Earth once, with oceans and quite possibly simple life. However, something strange happened to Mars about 4.2 billion years ago. It stopped being a magnet. Why is this important? It's magnetism that shields the planet from the worst of the Sun's solar wind. It literally repels it. In the center of the Earth, there's a molten core of iron. As it flows, it creates the magnetic effect with which we are familiar, through compasses and the like. Why does the core flow? It's largely thanks to the Moon. The Moon's gravity massages the Earth and keeps the planet's core molten. Without the Moon, the core would cease to flow and no longer create the magnetism. Lose the Moon and we end up like Mars. Not a cheerful thought. Top 10 Fascinating Facts About the International Space Station Number 10. Trampolines in Space Could the US use trampolines to send astronauts into space? This was the suggestion of Dmitry Rogozin, Russia's Deputy Prime Minister. How did this bizarre proposal come about? The ISS is owned jointly by the United States, Russia, Canada, Japan and several European countries. Each country owns part of the station with the Europeans collectively owning a section. However, the ISS is actually divided into two main parts, one under US control and the other under Russia control. Unfortunately, politics reared its ugly head in 2014. The US imposed sanctions on Russia and broke off relations with the Russian equivalent of NASA, Roscosmos. This wouldn't have been a headache if the US hadn't scrapped its space shuttles and therefore is unable to get its astronauts to or from the ISS by itself. Instead, America relies solely on Russian launches and, if the politics deteriorate, the US astronauts on the ISS could find themselves stranded and Russia could take full control of the station. Number 9. The Falling Space Station Though the ISS astronauts float around their home, it's not entirely right to call that zero gravity. The ISS orbits the Earth at a height of between 200 and 250 miles. At that distance to the Earth, its gravitational effect is still 90% of what it's like on the ground. That's easily enough to cause the ISS to fall to Earth. So what's happening to keep it there? The ISS is falling. However, because of its speed and trajectory, it's actually falling along the curve of the Earth, missing it second by second. In effect, it's falling around the Earth. This is, of course, the same thing that's happening to the Moon. The astronauts, therefore, are in free fall with the ISS, which makes them seem weightless. 8. Rapid Days The astronauts on the International Space Station can see this clearly, though here on Earth we only experience it as either dawn or dusk. Because the ISS orbits the Earth every 90 minutes, they experience both sunrise and sunset 16 times a day. This means that an astronaut on the ISS 
experiences 5,840 sunrises and sunsets a year, whereas we just get a measly 365. Number 7. Toilet Wars In the early days, astronauts and cosmonauts on the International Space Station shared everything – food, equipment and facilities including toilets. Around 2003, Russia decided to charge other nations for use of the Russian equipment and facilities. In retaliation, the other nations began billing Russia for the same. By 2005, Russia put in bills for transporting American astronauts to the ISS. And, in this strange and utterly puerile game of ping-pong, the US banned the Russians from using anything that belonged to the US, including going for a pee. Number 6. Up in Flames Washing machines in space? No, not a sequel to the hilarious 1980 movie Airplane, but a total impossibility. The weight, the water, these add up to a no-go. So what do the astronauts and cosmonauts do about their dirty laundry? At five to $10,000 per transit between the ISS and the Earth, they can't send it back to mum. And space may be immense outside, but it's very limited inside the ISS, so they just burn their dirty clothes. So how is it they don't end up in the altogether? Well, first, in their temperature and humidity controlled environment, they simply don't sweat as much as we tend to do here on Earth. Also, they move by floating around, which evidently is less energetic. And since everything up there is sterile, they don't get dirty either. Therefore, they only change their clothes once or twice a week. From time to time, Russia sends unmanned spacecraft to deliver supplies, including fresh clothes. Whilst the craft is docked, it's loaded with dirty clothes, trash and what is called elimination waste. And then the craft is simply allowed to fall back to Earth over the Pacific Ocean, incinerating on the way down. Number 5. Elon Musk to the rescue We've already mentioned that since the US sanctions and the cancellation of the Space Shuttle program, Mother Russia now holds all the cards as regards to the International Space Station. It can't actually ban any other nation from the ISS, but it could be awkward. Awkwardness can usually be overcome by careful diplomacy. But one thing that could cause grave difficulties to the ISS is that Russia is planning to stop its ISS space program by 2020. In 2014, Dmitry Rogozin, Russia's sarcastic deputy prime minister, stated that their resources are to be spent on other space activities. The US is very disappointed about this as it wished to continue sending astronauts to the ISS until at least 2024. Unfortunately, without being able to hitch a lift from Russian spacecraft, this is a no-go. NASA is desperately trying to persuade commercial space companies like Elon Musk's Space Exploration Technologies Corporation, or SpaceX, to assist, either to rescue its astronauts or to keep the program going. Fingers crossed, Musk has announced that he's interested. Number 4. Ouch. There are some serious health downsides to spending long periods floating in space, some dangerous and some just antisocial. Typically, ISS astronauts and cosmonauts spend about six months in space. With every month that passes, they lose nearly 2% of the minerals in their bones. This is known as space flight osteopenia. Some astronauts have lost a quarter of their bone mass. Actually, it's a bit more complicated than that. Bone remodels in response to stress. So areas under stress in space become more denser and those problems experiencing low stress become less dense. This bone distortion can cause serious problems. Everybody on the ISS has to do exercises using specialized equipment. Even so, the problem, though reduced, is still a threat to their health. Also, muscles waste away in weightlessness. Although this can be minimized by exercise and back on Earth can be reversed, muscle atrophy is linked to cancer, heart failure and liver failure. It's a wonder anyone wants to be an astronaut. Insomnia is common on the ISS, with medication being the only solution. However, this poses risks as in an emergency, you wouldn't want zombies in charge of a space station. And to cap it all, flatulence. Everyone suffers from it, both first-hand and second hand. Number 3. Immortality. In 2008, Richard Garriott paid 30 million US dollars 
to become the first private citizen to visit the International Space Station. He's an English-American video game designer and the son of NASA astronaut Owen Garriott. With him, he brought his Immortality Drive, a microchip time capsule containing the digitized DNA sequences of many significant friends, including Stephen Hawking and, of course, himself. His idea was that, should the Earth be destroyed, the Immortality Drive could be used by, um, aliens perhaps, to recreate humanity. It also contains an archive of humanity's greatest achievements. Let's hope for the future of humanity that the ISS doesn't fall from its orbit and burn out as it crashes to Earth. Number 2. Not Invited One country is totally banned from visiting the ISS – China. In 2011, the US Congress forbade any collaboration between America and Chinese space programs. The fear was that the Chinese were more interested in the potential military uses of space than in scientific research. Needless to say, this rebuff hasn't held the Chinese back. It has its own space program, has sent astronauts into space, and has even put a robot on the moon. It also plans to create its own space station to replace the ISS when its time is up. For some reason, they won't be inviting the US to join in. Number 1. Teddy Bear's Picnic Surprisingly, there are guns on the ISS. Each gun is capable of firing flares or rifle and shotgun rounds. These are supplied by Russia for their cosmonauts. They're not for defense up there, though, unless there are concerns about extraterrestrials. It's because of an incident in 1965 when returning cosmonauts landing on the ground, not in the oceans as the Americans do, were attacked by aggressive bears. Understandably, they wish to avoid being the main course of a teddy bear's picnic. Top 10 Comets That Have Gone Missing From time to time, astronomers find that comets that they've been tracking just disappear. No one is sure why. Here are 10 of the most famous missing comets. Number 10. The Soul of an Emperor A seven-day comet that was claimed to be the rising soul of a Roman emperor. That's the enigmatic Caesar's Comet, which, according to reports, was possibly the brightest comet that has ever been seen. The Roman statesman and general Julius Caesar was assassinated on the Ides of March, March the 15th in 44 BC. In his honor, Caesar's heir, Octavian, organized what he called the Games in honor of Caesar's victory, or Ludi Victoriae Caesaris. These games ran from July the 20th to the 28th, and during them, the mysterious comet appeared, appearing to announce Caesar's newly declared divine status. Seven days later, it disappeared. It's probable that it was a non-periodic comet. In other words, one that does not orbit the sun and may never be seen again. Number 9. Prophecies in the Sky A comet that killed the Pope. Well, that's what it claimed. In July 1264, Pope Urban IV became very ill, and a comet, so bright that it could be seen during the day, appeared in the skies. At that time, comets were considered to be bad omens, sent by supernatural entities to cause floods, diseases, and deaths. The Pope died three months later, on October the 3rd, 1264, and the comet disappeared that very day, an event that caused huge concern throughout the entire Holy Roman Empire. The comet came to be known as the Great Comet of 1264. It seemed to return in 1556, which gave the then Pope Pius V a rather unpleasant shock. Against his wishes, it was called the Great Comet of 1556. In fact, he needn't have worried. He stayed alive for another 16 years, during which time he excommunicated Queen Elizabeth I of England for heresy. An astronomer, Guy Pingra, claimed that the two were indeed the same comet and predicted that they would return again in 1848. It didn't. Though according to his calculations of a period of 292 years, we might see it again in 2140. In reality, they're almost certainly two disappearing comets. Number 8. Now you see it, now you don't. Comets usually have an easily calculated stable periodicity. Brawson's comet, otherwise known as 5D slash Brawson, seems to appear when it wants to. It was first spotted by Theodore Brawson on February 26, 1846, 
and remained visible for about two months before it travelled beyond the reach of early telescopes. Initially, there was some confusion about when it might return. At first, astronomer Johann Franz Enck thought its periodicity was 3.44 years, but eventually it was settled as being every five and a half years. September 1851 arrived, but the comet didn't. However, in 1857, it was spotted by astronomer Carl Christian Bruins. In 1862, it was expected again, and once again it failed to show up. But with great celebration, it did return in 1868. The stage was set for its reappearance in 1874, but it surprised everyone by making its entry a year early, and then missed its dates in 1879, 1884, 1895 and 1901. By this time, everyone had given up. Using advanced telescopes, astronomers gave it one final chance in 1973. But no! Why is it so eccentric? It passes close to the gas giant Jupiter, whose gravity keeps altering its orbit. Who knows whether it will be seen again. Number 7. Mrs. O'Leary's Comet some comets sort of disappear, or more accurately break into pieces to form several similar comets, most of which cannot be seen. One such splitting comet is Bias Comet. It was spotted by Jacques Lebax Montaigne on March 8, 1772. It was found again by Jean-Louis Pont in 1805, and then again by Wilhelm von Biela in 1826, who gave it its name. It returned in 1832, 1846 and 1852, and then was never seen again. However, Beeler's comet almost certainly broke apart in 1845. Author Mel Waskin, in his book Mrs. O'Leary's Comet – Cosmic Causes of the Great Chicago Fire, proposed this idea and suggested that it caused the fires that mysteriously, and probably not coincidentally, broke out in Chicago. Manistee, Michigan, and Pestigo, Wisconsin, all on October the 8th, 1871. Number 6. AWOL Belia's comet nearly made a comeback, or the part that hadn't crashed to Earth, probably causing those fires. In 1896, Charles Dillon Perrine discovered what he claimed was that missing fragment. He said that, without doubt, it would return in 1903. It didn't. For several years, astronomers looked out for it. In 1903, in 1909, in 1916, 1922, and 1929. But no! Eventually, it was spotted by Antonin Mirkos on October the 19th, 1955. Showing respect to its first discoverer, Charles Dillon Perrine, he named it Comet Perrine Mirkos, though with the caveat that it might actually be Beeler's Comet. American astronomer Leyland E. Cunningham who was one of the pioneers of electronic calculation during World War II, said that it wasn't a brand new comet, nor a Beeler's comet fragment, but confirmed that this was one spotted originally by Perina Mercos. Its eccentricity was caused by its orbital proximity to Jupiter. Comet Perine Mercos continued to appear erratically until 1975, when it was declared permanently missing. Number 5. The Power of Jupiter as we have seen, the giant gas Jupiter is often responsible for causing erratic orbits of comets. This is little wonder, as it's the largest planet in our solar system, with a mass two and a half times the total mass of all the other planets. Its gravitational force is immense, and anything that passes nearby either plunges into it or has its orbital trajectory significantly altered. It was first spotted in 1770 by French astronomer Charles Messier, it was famous for creating a catalogue of 110 nebulae in star clusters, the so-called Messier objects. Its orbit was calculated by 18th-century astronomer Anders Johann Lexel, who gave it its name, Comet Lexel. He measured its closest distance to the Earth at approximately 1.5 million miles, the closest known comet. Lexel said that the comet would reappear every 5.5 years. Unfortunately, it never returned again. French astronomer Aubert Leferrier, who was famous for predicting the existence of Neptune using only mathematics, worked out that Jupiter had affected the comet's orbit. Either the gas giant had increased its orbit, and thereby the length of time it would take to return, or had cast it away from our solar system. Number 4. Comet Watching Parties 
Halley's Comet, certainly the most famous one of all, was once upstaged by another one which came to be called the Great Daylight Comet of 1910. It was January 1910, and at the time of great enthusiasm about all things scientific, the public's attention was turned towards the sky. Halley's Comet was due. It came as a big surprise that another one suddenly appeared. It was so bright that everyone could see it clearly, even during the day. It was at least five times brighter than the planet Venus. The first people to spot it on January the 12th were some miners in South Africa. However, in the land of entrepreneurs, the United States of America, comet watching parties were arranged and the public could watch it through telescopes at a price. The Great Daylight Comet of 1910 stayed visible for about a month, but has never been seen again. Number 3. Fatal Attraction Not all comets are snappy like Halley's Comet. One such is 83D slash Russell, whose previous name was no more evocative, 83P slash Russell. It made a one-month appearance on June 16, 1979, and was discovered by Kenneth S. Russell. Highly respected astronomer M. P. Candy calculated its orbit as 7.43 years. However, Daniel W. E. Green of the Department of Earth and Planetary Scientists at Harvard University disagreed and said it would return in 6.13 years. He was right, and it appeared in April 1985. Unfortunately, afterwards it succumbed to the influence of Jupiter and has never been seen again. Although astronomers keenly looked out for it in 1991, 1998 and 2006, they accepted that 83D slash Russell had probably been destroyed by straying too close to the gas giant. Number 2. Millions of miles for nothing The National Aeronautics and Space Administration NASA, was so confident that Comet Boethin would return when they sent their deep impact spacecraft to intercept it. It had been discovered on January 4, 1975, by Reverend Leo Boethin of the Philippines. By his and others' calculations, it was expected to return in 11 years. And they were right. In January 1986, it turned up again, remaining clear in the sky for two months. Although it failed to return in December 2008, with poor observational conditions blamed, NASA launched their craft in 2005, programmed to orbit the Sun. Sadly, the multi-million mile journey was in vain, nothing was seen, and they concluded that it had broken apart. Number 1. Watch and Hope We need to keep our eyes peeled in March 2021. There's a chance that we might see missing comet 75D slash Kahutek. It was spotted in February 1975 by Czech astronomer Lobos Kahutek, who is actually more famous for the similarly named Comet Kahutek. As a brief aside, Comet Kahutek is interesting in that the world of astronomy was very excited about it, and it turned out to be a huge disappointment. It's a long-period comet that first appeared in our skies about 150,000 years ago, and we'll have to wait another 75,000 years to see it again. It's a Kuiper Belt object and was promoted as the Comet of the Century. Unfortunately, it partly broke up as it approached the Sun, though it was clearly seen by the crews of Skylab 4 and Soyuz 13. Anyway, its similarly named 75D slash Kahutek was only seen from Earth because Jupiter altered the comet's orbit on July 28, 1972. The Top 10 Curious and Fun Facts About Area 51 Number 10. Paradise Lost What would be a good name for a dry, inhospitable place that tested weapons, including nuclear ones. Does the word paradise come to mind? In 1955, at the request of the CIA, Clarence Leonard Kelly Johnson, a brilliant American aeronautical and systems engineer, initiated the construction of an airbase at Groom Lake, Nevada. He realized that it might be difficult to entice scientists and personnel to such a barren location, and that's why he proposed that Area 51 should be called Paradise Ranch. But after complaints by disappointed recruits, it was renamed Area 51. He was justifiably famous for developing the Lockheed U-2 and many other supersonic aircraft, but perhaps his skills in PR were a little limited. Number 9. Synchronized Hoovering 
Imagine if you would, 30 Air Force personnel, shoulder to shoulder, marching down a runway, hoovering it. It's like a bizarre scene from The Simpsons, or from the British absurdist comedy Monty Python's Flying Circus. And yet apparently, this happens nearly every day at Area 51. The Nevada desert is great for keeping the operations cheap and isolated. The weather is perfect for flights, and the flat lake bed is ideal for building runways. But it's so dusty that aeroplane engines easily get jammed. And for that reason, the base crew has to regularly sweep and vacuum the runways. None of them has ever said whether they enjoy the task, but they probably think it sucks. 8. Extraterrestrial Dolls when an aeronautical engineer with 40 years' experience at Lockheed Martin, who has 25 patents about laser-guided smart bomb systems, claims to have been involved with aliens, perhaps we should take him seriously. Boyd Bushman claimed that he'd helped extraterrestrial beings to implement anti-gravity technology at Area 51. He further stated that there were two types of alien, Wrangler and Rustler aliens, who could travel between Earth and their own planet in only 45 minutes. As part of his proof, Boyd Bushman published a photograph of one of the aliens. Unfortunately, it was actually identified as a plastic alien doll that could be bought at Walmart. Number 7. Not so much of a secret Area 51 was supposed to be such a secret that the Central Intelligence Agency didn't acknowledge its existence until 2013. And the only reason for the official disclosure was that, following the passing of the Freedom of Information Act, they'd no choice. Of course, no one was actually surprised. Area 51's existence had been known about for decades. Indeed, 20 years earlier, Larry King had hosted a documentary about it on network TV. Anyway, after the request, the CIA explained that the facility was used to test airplanes like the U-2 and the A-12, and also for research on behalf of the Atomic Energy Commission. Needless to say, there was no reference to extraterrestrials or UFOs. Number 6. Trespassing Satellites Although civilians can drive up to the gates of Area 51, entering it would not be advisable. Trespassing may result in a $1,000 fine, six months in prison, or both. But that hasn't stopped Google. In 2016, Google Earth published satellite images of Area 51, including a landing strip nearby. The runway is about a mile long, and there's a number of hangars clustered at one end. It is known that the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense both use the site. And although there's no official explanation as to its use, security experts have suggested that it's a drone testing site. Number 5. Lucky Breakdance The BBC has a reputation of being highly sensible and respectable, and not given to silly pranks. This reputation hit the dirt in 2012, or more accurately, its reporters did. A BBC camera crew attempted to break into Area 51, they were rather disappointed as, to begin with, all they found was nothing of any interest. So to pass the time and have something for the cameras to record, they performed silly alien-style dances. Within minutes, they found themselves held at gunpoint and for three hours forced to lie face down in the dirt. After background checks were completed, they were allowed to go. Bearing in mind the warnings that are on the signs around the base, threatening arrest, fines and imprisonment, they certainly got lucky. Number 4. Don't mess with Goliath We've all heard the biblical story about plucky David and his battle with Goliath. Unfortunately, in reality, it's usually Goliath who wins. In 1880, the Shehan family acquired mining rights for a location near Area 51's testing runway. But, they claim in the 1950s, they started being harassed. They said that aeroplanes strafed their property and on several occasions they were held at gunpoint in their own home. They also said that the mine was rendered useless, having been polluted with radiation through nuclear testing at Area 51, and in 1954 they claimed that their mine had been firebombed by the Air Force. To avoid a court appearance, the government offered them $5.2 million for their land, but they refused. 
and a few months later, after the offer had expired, the 400 acres of land was allegedly seized. 3. Closed? Really? Area 51 was officially abandoned in 1997 after the launching of the U-2 spy plane. So it came as a bit of a surprise that a highly advanced surveillance drone was shown to the public at Area 51 in 2014. In 2011, the Iranian military had captured an RQ-170 drone and had begun to reverse engineer it. The American military officials were not overly worried as they were dissatisfied with its quality and performance. Their new model, the RQ-180, was unveiled in 2014, correcting problems with the earlier model's aerodynamics. It was able to stay aloft for 24 hours with a range of over 1,200 miles and was extremely maneuverable. The RQ-170 drone, in contrast, had a maximum limit of just six hours and its guidance system was unreliable. Quite a result for a research facility that had allegedly been closed down 20 years earlier. Number 2. Not quite what they said Many claims have been made about what was really going on at Area 51. The most popular ones were promoted in Annie Jacobson's book, Area 51, An Uncensored History. During her research, she'd interviewed a number of retired personnel who had worked at the base. She claimed that they had told her about secret work on reverse engineering alien technology and that the base had numerous flying saucers hidden in underground tunnels. Unfortunately, many of the interviewees subsequently said that she'd misrepresented them and their views. Reverse engineering of technology was going on, but it was the reverse engineering of Soviet technology following the capture of MiG jet fighters during the Cold War of the 1970s and 80s. They accepted that there were secret underground tunnels, but that they were associated with the Project NERVA nuclear research program conducted near Area 51 at a location called Jackass Flats. And the flying saucers? The indignant interviewees said that there was a vehicle dubbed the Ox Cart, which was a circular, fuel-carrying pod that admittedly did resemble a stereotypical flying saucer. Number 1. A road like no other Nevada State Route 375 doesn't sound particularly enticing as a tourist spot, but extraterrestrial highway, that sounds like fun. In 1996, the state, to coincide with the release of the movie Independence Day, renamed Nevada State Route 375 to the extraterrestrial highway because it passes by Area 51. There are quirky rest stops all along the 98-mile stretch of road. At the intersection of the extraterrestrial highway and US-93 is the E.T. Fresh Jerky restaurant. Inside, there's a mural that depicts an alien-style Wild West scene complete with alien cowboys. Further down the road, there's an Alien Research Center gift shop with its enormous alien statue standing guard. And at the town called Rachel, with its 40 inhabitants, there's a quirky and eccentric cafe called The Little A. Leon, full of kitsch and memorabilia, and locals eager to share their stories of alien experiences. Like him or loathe him, Elon Musk is certainly one of the most interesting characters around. A visionary? A fraudster? Only time will tell. We've all heard of his ambitious, possibly crazy plans to colonize Mars, and he certainly launched the project with a memorable prank when he used his own midnight cherry Tesla Roadster as a dummy payload for the Falcon Heavy test flight in February 2018. The mission was successful, and the car is now in an elliptical, heliocentric orbit that crosses the orbit of Mars. When he announced his plan a year earlier, Musk said that because the launch was very risky, it would carry, quote, the silliest thing we can imagine. The driver is a full-size mannequin called Starman, dressed in a SpaceX precious spacesuit with his left elbow casually resting on the open windowsill. The sound system plays David Bowie's song Space Oddity on a continuous loop. A copy of Douglas Adams' novel The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is in the glove box. And for the aficionados of this great book, there's a towel on the back seat and on the dashboard a sign that reads Don't Panic in large friendly letters. The launch was live-streamed from an onboard camera, but contrary to some reports, it was never meant to achieve a Mars orbit. 
This would have been impossible given that it wasn't equipped with propellant or manoeuvring and communications capabilities. Western Australia police joined in the fun. They tweeted a photo of them pointing a radar gun aimed at the Tesla as it passed over Australia. It's not known if Musk has paid the speeding ticket. The only downside of this great jape is that there's a 6% chance that the roadster will collide with the Earth, albeit in about 3 million years' time. Starman will then become the most famous crash test dummy ever. Following this eccentric first test using the Falcon Heavy rocket, Musk's company, SpaceX, announced details of their plans to colonize Mars by using a more advanced vehicle. And using it, SpaceX plans to send an unpiloted cargo mission to Mars in 2022. It will install solar power, equipment for mining, and life support infrastructure. It will also identify possible threats to potential colonization. Musk calls his spacecraft the Big Falcon Rocket, or BFR. It is a fully reusable vehicle with the capability of launching 150 tons into Earth orbit, more than any other rocket. Doing this will be the first step to its potential use in long-duration spaceflight, including as a cargo ship to Mars. Its propulsion system is revolutionary, using an engine which uses methane as its fuel. As a side note, the F in BFR originally stood not for Falcon, but for another rather Anglo-Saxon word. We'll leave it for you to work that one out. But once on Mars, what about the return journey? Elon Musk has figured that out as well. The main purpose of his cryogenic methalox fueled propulsion system is that the power source could be manufactured on Mars. In 2018, SpaceX announced its plans to include a propellant plant on its initial cargo missions. Rather than transporting hydrogen from Earth to make methane and oxygen, as others, including NASA, have proposed, the company intends to mine the frozen water that's abundant on and just below the surface of the Red Planet. The first missions would only take astronauts and cargo, but Musk also intends to take fee-paying passengers in the future. The Big Falcon rocket, or BFR, would be able to accommodate 100 people in its 40 cabins. There are large communal and entertainment areas psychologically necessary because the mission would take months. Elon Musk expects that by 2060, there could be a million residents on Mars. To establish this colony, Musk plans at least 10,000 flights in his BFRs, in addition to the ones that will be carrying equipment and supplies. First, of course, the BFR has to be up and running. Conservative estimates put the cost of development at over $10 billion. So, how's he going to pay for it? Launching satellites, telescopes, cleaning up debris, and servicing the ISS. However, the Martian colonists would be facing, as Musk put it, fairly expensive tickets. He anticipates that years further down the line, the cost of tickets could drop to $100,000 or $200,000, so, if you own a house and sell it, you could find yourself joining the other colonists basking in the Martian dust storms and radiation. In September 2016, Elon Musk first announced his intention to colonize Mars. He wanted humanity to be an interplanetary species, largely because of the threats of nuclear war, pandemics, ecological degradation and climate change. The biggest problem facing him wasn't the technology, he considered that to be inevitable, but was financing his project. In his presentation at the International Astronautical Congress in Adelaide, Australia, he gave hints as to his business plan. True to form, his independent spirit, he was going to finance it himself. He would make SpaceX's entire existing fleet of vehicles obsolete. The Falcon Heavy, the Falcon 9 and the Dragon and focus exclusively on the BFR. He would cannibalize the retired fleet and use much of it in the BFR's development and construction. Apart from recycling his present fleet, Musk also intends to raise money by offering services to other space enterprises. The reusable Big Falcon rocket would put satellites and telescopes into orbit and clean up space debris. This last project is essential for the future of space exploration. On July 5, 2016, the United States Strategic Command announced that they were tracking 17,852 artificial objects orbiting the Earth. This is only debris able to be tracked. 
By January 2019, new technology led to a major revision of this number. It's quite shocking. There are 128 million bits smaller than half an inch, nearly 900,000 pieces that are half to four inches in size and 34,000 pieces larger than that. Already, this debris is causing problems. Collisions are occurring that risk the integrity of space vehicles and the tiny particles are found to be coating telescope optics. And it doesn't help that India has a policy of deliberate destruction of its own defunct satellites, as occurred in 2019. One encouraging proposal for raising revenue is Musk taking over from the Russians in servicing the International Space Station when they end their involvement in 2020. In addition, Musk intends using the Big Falcon rocket to provide earthbound travel services. At present, the flight between Los Angeles and New York takes about five hours. Fancy doing it in less than 15 minutes? There's a huge bonus to the Big Falcon rocket's missions to the Moon and Mars. Musk intends to provide an alternative to present-day airplane flights. From the Earth, the BFR would zoom into low orbit, where there's little friction and no bad weather and turbulence, and then zoom back down to a landing pad. Fancy going around the world? No problem, just less than an hour. But apart from getting there and back, what other challenges would Musk's Martian colonization face? One, certainly, is how to obtain sufficient liquid water. If you've seen the 1964 classic movie Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, you'll remember that amazing scene near the end with Slim Pickens as he rides the atomic bomb falling from the plane. Will we see Elon Musk doing this one day, in a cowboy costume, waving his wide-brimmed hat and shouting yee-haw? One of his proposals is to nuke the Red Planet's poles to release water trapped beneath the surface. Although he claims to have done the math, it's not actually known if he's serious or whether it's one of his more eccentric jokes. Given that part of the inspiration for his project is to get away from nuclear warfare and environmental pollution, it would be a rather strange way to kick off mankind's interplanetary aspirations and can probably be dismissed as dark humor. But there is one challenge that cannot be dismissed, and it's one that faces not just Musk, but all enterprises in zero or low gravity. Health. Let's look at this in detail. One of the assertions frequently made by flat earthers to prove a stationary earth, and we're not here to mock anyone, is that we'd feel the astounding speeds it's traveling through space. For example, that the Earth is spinning at up to a thousand miles per hour, depending upon your location. Here, that we orbit the Sun at about 67,000 miles per hour, and that the Sun and the solar system are moving through space at about half a billion miles per hour. They say we'd notice it. The response, of course, is that we have no senses that can perceive constant speed, only changes in velocity, acceleration, deceleration and changes of direction. The reality for the passengers going to Mars is that they wouldn't have any convenient false gravity caused by motion as nearly all the journey would be at the same speed. And weightlessness brings some serious problems. With every month that passes, our bones lose nearly 2% of their minerals. This can make them brittle and is largely irreversible. Everyone on board would have to do exercises using specialized equipment. Even so, the problem, though reduced, would still be a threat to health. Muscles waste away in weightlessness and, though reversible, muscle atrophy is linked to cancer, heart failure and liver failure. Red blood cell production is appreciably lowered too. Anemia, as it's called, reduces oxygen concentrations in the body, which can cause dizziness, shortness of breath, fatigue and heart palpitations. The immune system is also negatively affected. This can result in type 1 diabetes, sinus, ear and skin infections, bronchitis, inflammation of internal organs, pneumonia, meningitis and arthritis. And, to trump it all, flatulence in a big way. But is there really a market for such adventures? Elon Musk has frequently expressed his disappointment that the US, once the leader in moon exploration, hasn't returned there since 1972. 
It's possible that the Chinese success in landing a rover, the U-2, on the Moon in December 2013 may help to reignite the lunar space race. Indeed, almost exactly four years later to the day, President Trump signed a directive for NASA to refocus on the Moon. On hearing the news, Musk said, Huh? We should have had a lunar base by now. Three months before President Trump's announcement, Musk stated that he intended to land there in just a few years with his big Falcon rocket, delivering cargo and people. In May 2019, NASA put in a request to Congress for an additional $1.6 billion, on top of the $21.5 billion already agreed, to achieve a lunar landing by 2024. And most of this money is being offered to private companies, including SpaceX. So yes, although the timescales will inevitably change, it would appear that Musk is on the right track and spurred on, no doubt, by the other companies who have expressed similar aspirations. Well, will the eccentric but brilliant and fiercely ambitious Elon Musk be the victor? In a reversal of H.G. Wells' classic, The War of the Worlds, are we set to invade Mars? The race is on.